you're watching Anderson Community Television, this is your August edition of Anderson Speaks. Welcome, I'm your host, Kyle Densler, and I'd like to introduce to you all out there in Anderson land, our first guest with us is Wendy Silvius. She is a resident of Mount Washington, and she also teaches at Indian Hill, and she's got some really cool stories to share with us. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, uh, you're here to discuss uh, a little trip. A little trip? Took. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was a pretty big trip, actually. I was very fortunate to be um, able to travel to Ghana last March to West Africa to participate in teacher exchange and it was part of a program called Teachers for Global Classrooms. Hmm. And how, how were you made aware of this trip? Is this something that you've been a part of or is this all kind of new to you? Well, um, I'm always interested in international travel and I've been, I teach geography at Indian Hill so I've been very that fortunate to um, be able to go out there and see some of the places that I teach about and I had not been to Africa at all and uh, became aware of this program through the U.S. State Department. So they made teachers aware of it just, you know, through email and, and it was something that you could apply for and always interested in a new adventure and wanting to be able to share firsthand stories with my students, I decided to apply for it and uh, fortunately was accepted uh, to participate last year. So it was a little more than just a trip. It had a large um, professional development component to it where awesome. um, we had an online class that we took and we got to network with other teachers around the country as we learned more about global education and how to bring the rest of the world into our classrooms um, and of course there's no better way to do that than having a first-hand experience and having stories to tell and and those stories and those first-hand connections with people are much more interesting to students than information in a book or you know some type of statistics so it was a Definitely. great great way to bring the world into my classroom awesome do you have any idea of the total number of people that got to participate in this trip? The total number of teachers every year, I think, is around 75 um, from around the country because there are actually six different countries that the State Department sends teachers to. And the oh, State wow. Department does a lot of exchanges. Um, they have their Fulbright exchanges and um, you know lots of different programs, but this is just one of their programs that they do. Awesome. So they just load you up, fly you over, and stick you on a bus, and then you guys have to... <laughs> Like, when you Not get a bunch quite. of teachers with no, no students around, no, we you guys were have to we had a, a member of uh, they, they actually they administer this program through a, a nonprofit called IREX, the International Research and Exchanges Board, and so we had a person who um, worked for IREX who had been to Ghana before, who was with us, and everything was planned um, very thoroughly. And uh, Ghana is an easy country to get around in; everyone speaks English, very very friendly. But we did have that additional help of having a guide and, and all, all the things taken care of for us. It was very easy for us. Why Ghana? Why, what was significant about that specific country? Yeah, well, the countries were selected by the State Department, and I think Ghana is a country that a lot of um, Westerners travel to because everyone speaks English. Ghana was a British colony. Um, it's also very stable in terms of its you know, political environment. It's uh, very welcoming to guests overall. And uh, Ghana is, um, in, in terms of its development, is um, a little, maybe a little more developed than some other countries in mm -hmm. West Africa. So the infrastructure to travel and um, have access to some of the things that we're maybe used to back home are there. So it's just a great country to visit for a person who's having their first time um, to someplace they're not familiar with or a part of the world that they're not familiar with. And where's the farthest you've traveled before this? Before this, um, Germany. Really? Germany, yes, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of different kind of culture, temperature. Yeah, yeah yes, day. very, very warm being near the equator. That was um, you know, one of the, the hard things actually for me about the trip, although I'm from Florida, so I should be used to it, but I think I've gotten <laughs> um, spoiled here not being cold, not being hot so often, so mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, about just some of the logistical parts, in case people are curious. Mm -hmm. um, you had several months of probably planning. You got to get mm -hmm. passports together, et cetera. Uh, how long is the flight over? Uh, how yeah, many? Yeah, the flight over is actually shorter than the flight to Germany. It was about 11 hours okay. over, and it was a direct flight from 
uh, New York City to Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. Very cool. And how long were you there again? I was there for two weeks, and I was I was uh, very fortunate because most of the other teachers in our group, there were 10 teachers in our group going to Ghana, and most of the other teachers stayed near the coast and near the capital city. But my travel partner, who was another teacher from Philadelphia, and I were selected to go to this village in the rainforest. And our wow. village was called Sefwi Bakwai. And it was about an eight hour trip, not because it was so far, but just the roads mm -hmm. weren't um, great all the way. But it was an eight hour trip into the heart of Ghana and uh, being able to experience more of rural life and see how people are living who are um, mostly in cocoa farming. And mm -hmm. so some of the kids at the school I visited walked, uh, I think the longest walk we had was seven miles. Somebody was walking seven miles each way to school. Hmm. So it was very interesting to see how the school functioned um, because it was more of a boarding school, really. Um, the students, most of the students lived there, and then some of the students walked from around the area. So it kind of served the region since not everyone in high school gets, uh, not, not everyone in Ghana gets to go to high school. Mm -hmm. um, the kids who do sometimes have a commute like that or have to live there. Okay. What was your main focus or, or kind of main thrust for being there? Was mm -hmm. it to study how they educate or was mm -hmm. it to learn about the culture? Was it all of that? Yeah, it was really all of that. And with a cultural exchange, the great thing is it's a sharing process. So I have things to learn from you. You have things to learn from me. So we wanted to see how the school worked, um, what types of technology they had, how it operated, what it was like culturally with the students. And so all of that was very, very interesting. Um, there were so many differences, but yet you find out wherever you go that kids are basically the same, you know. Um, but one thing is all students in Ghana wear uniforms. Mm. Um, so what it do you think was, about that? You know, it was interesting, too, that it wasn't even just the uniforms. They all have the same haircut. They, all, they shave everybody's head, and that's how they know you're a student. Wow. Um, every student has their head shaved, girls and boys. And so... Um, it was definitely a more formal relationship with their teachers that they had. They had to address them as Madame and um, Sir, and they were very, very formal. So that was one thing that was interesting as we were trying to do some question and answer with them. We would try to get them to speak with us informally the way we would with our students when we were having an exchange. And they finally did kind of come around and were able to do that, but that was, we found they were shy at first and mm. they were used to doing more of a recitation type interaction with their teachers where there's some specific answer they're supposed to give rather than maybe asking questions. Mm. Um, so it was interesting to see those differences and um, just to be able to be there and experience the people and experience the culture. You might have already answered part of this, but mm -hmm. my next thing I was curious about is whether it's through education or just culturally, uh, what was the biggest difference you saw there versus mm -hmm. what we're accustomed to here? And then what would be a strong similarity or maybe one that would surprise people? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess the biggest difference, um, since I was focused on kids and focused on education, uh, more, more people in Ghana are um, still working as farmers. Um, it's still over 50% pe of pe the people in agriculture, whereas it's less than 1% in the mm -hmm. United States. So um, because of that, there still are a lot of kids who are being expected to provide additional labor at home, just as it was in the United States years ago. So they're not all in school. Um, and that is one of the things, you know, development-wise um, that, that affects Ghana because especially you know, when girls are not educated, as we're learning so much about today, mm -hmm. um, it affects the development of the country. They're going to marry younger. They're going to have more kids. And so um, just just kind of being there and seeing that and experiencing it personally and seeing how people are affected, how kids are affected by it and families, um, that was a big difference and something that was interesting. Um, and then small things like, you know, just having the power kind of go out randomly. <laughs> um, they were very used to that and they had a name for it. You know, they said it just um, happens kind of daily um, and then it comes back on. So, you know, just experiencing those things um, were the, noticing the differences. Um, as far as being the same, I would say, you know, the experience at school, though different, I saw a lot of similarities. Um, 
the kids maybe uh, weren't allowed to voice their discontent with what was going on in class the same way American students are. So that is a big difference. American students will tell you when they don't like the activity you're doing or um, if, there's, if they're bored, they'll let you know and they would never do that. They were much more reserved about those things. But at the same time, kids are kids, you know, and we laughed and we um, had a good time with them and um, they were excited to get little goodies that we brought them just as American students would be excited to get things from there. So it was, it was great. Very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, typical similar subject matter that they're studying at, at appropriate kind of comparable age ranges to, to what we're used to here? Uh, not exactly, and I, I think there were some similarities in the curriculum, but they had a real lack of resources. Um, I'm very fortunate in Indiana Hill to be very rich in resources for teaching, and that was one thing, um, going back to differences, is that just the, the lack of books, um, one computer lab for everybody, but not a lot of consistent access to the Internet. Um, so, yeah, it was a little more challenging for them. They have a curriculum uh, comes down to them from the central government. Mm -hmm. So um, all the schools are working on that same curriculum. And I noticed in the social studies curriculum, because that's what I focused on since that's what I teach, that there was a lot of information in there um, just talking about development and how can Ghana move forward. Um, you know, what, are, what things are important in terms of government. Um, one really interesting interaction I had with a student there was in talking about how uh, when we were on our way to the school, I had been stopped, We'd, our car had been stopped, and we had been asked for a bribe by a policeman actually to be able to continue along the way. Wow. And so it, it opened up an opportunity as I was talking about the United States and we were talking about government and corruption and how that holds back the development of a country. and. And I shared the story with them, and I said, you know, in the United States, um, that really wouldn't happen. And if it did, that police officer would get in a lot of trouble, and that is a really important thing to have the rule of law. So we were able to have that exchange. And I noticed their curriculum included a lot of things like that that was focused on helping the young people understand what the important things were going, going to be for the development of Ghana to proceed. Wow. So definitely a focus on developing good citizens. Yeah, yeah, the importance of the rule of law, the importance of education, the importance of um, tribes coming together and cooperating and, and agreeing on mm -hmm. things. We could probably use some of that here, <laughs> some of that wow. curriculum here, but yeah, it was, it was very good. Now, uh, global competencies, what do you mean by that mm -hmm. and why, why is that important? Yeah, global competencies are something that we focused on in our professional development before the trip. So that was um, helping students to uh, understand that they want to, that they're able to investigate the world on their own, that they're asking questions about it, that they're developing intercultural skills to be able to communicate with people from different cultures and have an understanding of, you know, what, what the right things to say are and, and to express themselves across cultures. Um, also, just encouraging them to take action on things that they've learned, to be global citizens in the sense that um, since we live in such an interconnected world and uh, things that happen here affect things that happen around the world and vice versa, that we want students to acquire these, these global competencies in the 21st century because we want them to be able to um, take action on things when they learn how maybe things happening in the United States affect things happening abroad. So whether that's in commerce or whether that's in government, um, we, we're encouraging active citizens and we're encouraging um, intercultural communication. Awesome. Now, how did your students get involved with this? Yeah, the students were, of course, excited about the trip and at, at the time and wanted to be able to have some kind of personal connection with it since I was going during the school year. I went in March right before spring break. So they wrote letters to the students at the high school that I visited. So when I got there, we, we had the teachers distributed the letters, and I thought we were going to do one letter per student and kind of create a pin pal relationship. Um, the teachers at the high school in Sefwi Bakwai were really concerned about not leaving anybody out, so what they ended up doing was passing the letters around, and each of my students got a response from more than one student there. Wow. So they wrote them letters back, and they talked about their lives, and they, they kind of exchanged a little bit of personal information where appropriate. And uh, then some of them even shared, you know, find me on Facebook or here's my email address mm. and uh, some of the students in Ghana. So they, they were able to make some personal connections when I got back. 
And then my students were so interested in the kinds of things that the Ghanaian students asked for because they asked for things like a book or actually some of them asked for a Bible. They're all, all Christian, most of them are Christians. And, and so that was a really interesting chance to share about the cultural differences. And then some of my students wanted to go ahead and purchase those things for wow. their exchange partners. So they did do that and we sent a big box of um, things over to those students uh, last spring after we had a chance to gather them and talk about it. So, I think a typical student, especially high school, might be like, what kind of phone do I want to ask for? Mm -hmm. Or what entertainment system? Yes. And so what were some of the reactions when they saw these, yes, these yes. kids? Yes, yes. I loved it because one of the students said, she asked me for a geography book, <laughs> which is the subject I teach. And I, I, you know, I said, see, you know, this is really, really important stuff. But it was, yeah, I think it was really so good for them to see that you know when you lack these basic things how important they become to you and also um, with so many of the students asking for uh, Bibles I think it that really drove home that wow this you know they, they seem to be more religious maybe than we are and you know they, they really want this and so that was a chance to have that discussion too about their culture awesome awesome talk about your outfit here. Yeah. You, you've got a special dress on today? I do have a special dress on today. This fabric, I don't know if the um, viewers can see it, but it has the high school's uh, sort of crest on it in the name of the high school. And this was a fabric that the school had made because as we arrived, they were having an anniversary celebration. So they were celebrating 22 years as a high school. <laughs> and so they had, um, they had well, actually, they were supposed to have the celebration on their 20th anniversary. This is kind of funny, but this fabric was so important to the anniversary that when it didn't come in on time, they kept postponing mm -hmm. the, the celebration until it was all there. But uh, when we arrived, they said, oh, you know, we have some very exciting news. Saturday is our big anniversary celebration, and you're going to be here for it, and the chief is going to speak, and we're going to have all these important people speak, and we're going to be having, you know, dance and all these things going on. And so we want to make you um, the clothing so you'll be wearing the same clothing as everybody else. Hmm. So I'm not exaggerating this at all. I, I was taken to a seamstress to be measured at 6 p.m. the first night I got there. And I had this dress in my hotel room by 10 p.m. It was made per to fit me perfectly. Wow. And uh, my, my exchange partner had, had made a shirt for him exactly like this. And when we arrived at the anniversary there were a thousand people all wearing this fabric in some form. Wow. So it was visually spectacular, but it also just helped me to see how important that is to their culture, how you dress. And um, the, the fabric is all very symbolic to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're always wearing some kind of fabric that says something about what you're doing at that time. So it was just very interesting and very cool to be able to get the dress and then have it to bring home. Wow. Just something that strikes me, we only have a minute left now, so I, I, we won't be able to discuss this, but what strikes me is how modern they are in some ways, but mm -hmm. you talked about the chief, tribes, mm -hmm. and, and, and they're still they're st still pulling from that tradition as they move forward, which is just very mm -hmm. interesting. It's like, hey, my chief's on Facebook. Kind yeah. of, kind of <laughs> yeah. Real quick before yeah. we leave, if another teacher wants to participate in the TGC program, mm -hmm. how can they get more information and apply? Yes, well, they could go online really and just Google Teachers for Glo Global Classrooms and they would be directed to the web page that would give the information about how to apply. Um, I also have a website of my own that I did as my project for this program and it's called, um, the, the website is globaleducationgateway.weebly.com. Um, so if they go on and look for that Global Education Gateway, they could find Teachers for Global Classrooms or just um, Google Teachers for Global Classrooms and they'll find it. Awesome. Very yeah. cool. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Wendy. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm sure there's more you could share, but unfortunately we are out of time. So we are going to be gone for a quick break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with our next guest. Welcome. If you're just joining us, we are mid-stride with our August edition of Anderson Speaks, and we're here with our next guest. It's my pleasure to introduce to you all Madeline Nambuqua, 
and she is here with uh, just a fascinating story, something that I think you guys will really enjoy. Madeline, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now go ahead and tell the folks where you're from. I am from Zimbabwe. I was born in Harare. The city is called Harare now, but because Zimbabwe used to be a British colony, uh, the city used to be called Salisbury. So even though the city is called Harare now, and Zimbabwe is called Zimbabwe, my birth certificate still says I was born in Salisbury. So you, you were born in a place that doesn't exist on paper in a way. Like the yeah. name's not there anymore. <laughs> the name is not you there anymore. If you try to find on a map, you'd just be looking forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you were born in Zimbabwe, and mm -hmm. uh, obviously you made your way here to the States. Yes. Um, what was that journey like? Like, what, what, where were you in your life when, when that happened, and, and what did it take to get here? Um, I was in school, and I managed to meet a U.S. professor. His name is Al Alexander Bostic. He was my art professor. So with my talent of art, he kind of like was the one that uh, gave me the idea to come to the U.S., because he felt that if I come to the U.S., I'll be exposed to a world stage. Hmm. So I bought into the idea and, you know, found a scholarship. And I was, I, I went to the Midland Lutheran uh, School College in Nebraska, in Fremont. So that's how I came to the U.S. Okay. And you were studying art in Zimbabwe? Yes. And And... We're showing enough promise that one of the professors is like, you need to, you we, need. we need to bump you up here. Yeah. We need to send you up to the major leagues, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> wow. So I came to the major league <laughs> and I didn't even, I did not do my homework mm. because I did not even know uh, what the population in Nebraska was like. I did not know the, the weather. So I arrived in Nebraska in the middle of winter. Oh, wow in February the 2nd, 2002, uh, in formal shoes. You don't get a lot of snow and no in Zimbabwe, jacket. do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so weather shock, probably cultural shock, just yes. everything. What, what, I don't want to say possess as a person, but what does it take for a person? Did you know you were going to stay when you came, or was it temporary? I knew I was coming to school and I was just, I just wanted to do four years and then go back home. Okay. And my original idea was I can go uh, get a degree in the U.S., come back home and set a school. That was mm. my original idea. But I did not know that the, there's an immigration process that I would have to go through. Mm -hmm. There were financial things that I was going to go through. Wow. Because while I was here, the economy in Zimbabwe collapsed. So it okay. meant I was not going to have tuition enough to continue with school. Oh, wow. So when people are talking of like illegal immigrants or uh, aliens mm -hmm. <laughs> in the U.S., it's not everybody who is willing to be out of status. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you just cross the border and you are just here. Mm -hmm. You have an idea of what you want to do. But when things happen, when life happens, and you can't continue with what you, you came to do, it's, it's life-changing. It's, it's, it's a serious challenge. I bet. Because you are, you are in a place you don't know, you don't have relatives, you are coming from a culture where you are literally having so many people around you. You have the village around you. And then when mm -hmm. you get here, that village is not there. And you're trying to figure out things as you go. And you're in Nebraska as well, which yeah. is just... So, but, <laughs> so a point you're making is that when you came here, I mean, you, you came over on a, was it a student visa? Yes. So you came here, you were here legally, you, yes. you followed the rules, everything was good, but, mm -hmm. but uh, obviously circumstances beyond your control. 
yes. changed your situation, changed your ability to do what you wanted to do. And I think, you know, when we hear stories, or especially when they try to highlight something like this in a movie, that's usually what happens. Someone comes over here and then something major happens, it's like, what do I do now? Yeah. And, and uh, I assume that it, that happens more often than some people think it does. Yes. So, and and I, I honestly wish if people would be like more accommodative uh, because you never know what what a person that is out of uh, that who has come from outside the US is going through. Mm -hmm. So each time you are meeting a stranger, just a little kindness will probably help them. Definitely, definitely. So uh, you talked about student visa. Um, what are some of the ways or circumstances that lead to someone qualifying for a green card? Because is that the, is that the situation you were in where you had to figure out how you're going to be allowed to stay here longer yes. legally? And the green card was the answer? Yes. It, for me, it was the answer. <laughs> uh, but there are several ways that people can use to qualify for a green card. You can either have a family member apply for you, an immediate family member apply for you. It's called a petition. Mm -hmm. So once they file the petition for you, it, it uh, helps you to be legal and to do the whole process and then you can, you can be reinstated as a legal resident. And you can also uh, apply for a green card through work. For instance, if uh, you are an international student and you are here, you can be able to finish your program, uh, practice for one year, uh, find a company that might want to apply a green card for you, uh, that will also work. And um, you can, if you are outside of the United States, let's say you are in a place where there is war, you can come to the U.S. as a refugee and you can apply for asylum. And once you are granted, then you, you do the process and then you can eventually apply for a, for a green card. And once they give you the green card, then you have an option to either you know, hold the green card for 10 years or you can decide you know, after three years or after five years, you want to apply for citizenship. Hmm. So how far into your U.S. college tenure, how far into, uh, into that were you when the uh, instability happened in Zimbabwe and your situation changed? I had only gone, like, for one semester. Wow. So that was... Uh, that was interesting. <laughs> so, so your, how, does, how did it affect your situation specifically? Did you have to discontinue school? It affected my situation in, in, in a way that I had to move from Nebraska because I was living on campus. And then I had friends who invited me to Cincinnati and said, you know, instead of paying uh, boarding fees, mm -hmm. you can use the boarding fees to, towards your tuition. Okay. So then I came and they helped me to, uh, for a while, to, to go through school. Wow. So that's, that's, that was the way that I used to continue to go to school. So did you, were you able to continue to the same school or did you have to transfer out here? I had to transfer to Cincinnati. Okay. But you were able to complete your studies? I was not able to complete my studies because while I was while I was going through my studies, uh, I got interested in somebody else, in, in somebody. And then, you know, I thought, oh, I've fallen in love. I'm just going to settle down. I'm going to be married in the U.S. Uh, I didn't even think about the green card at the time because I didn't even know about the green card. So I was just like, oh, I'm going to settle in the U.S. It's going to be okay. And at, at, at the time, I was going to Cincinnati State. Okay. But when the marriage didn't work, that uh, threw everything out. Kind of had all your eggs because, in that basket. Yeah, <laughs> I had all my eggs in that basket. I was going to school, and then I thought, you know, uh, I'm going to school, 
and then I'm going to have a wedding and I'm going to settle down in the U.S. So I was kind of like preparing for that. But when things did not work, uh, it really put me in a lot of trouble. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you had to kind of t assess everything and, and come up with a different plan? Uh, yes. And I, it, was a, it was a huge struggle. Now you're in between status. Mm, okay. uh, you, you are married, but the man has left you. Then, but now you are not in school. You are in between. Kind of no man's land. Yeah. Good grief. So that's how, <laughs> how bad it can be for international people. But you have to, if I was to advise someone is assess things before you make decisions. Because every decision you make will be crucial for the next level. And especially if you are a student, just go to school maybe. That's the advice that I can give somebody. <laughs> Well, that's like getting involved in a land war in Asia. I mean, that's a classic blunder, getting, getting married too quick. <laughs> yeah. So I would, I would say if you're going to school, just go to school. See somebody you like and tell them we can get married out after school. That will work. There we go. That is, that is <laughs> wisdom and words to live by, kids. Write it down. No one's half the battle. Now you know. Now you need to make the right decision. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so how... Uh, not to skip ahead too far, but I, I want to ask some questions about the green card process. Um, how, how was your situation rectified? How did you get it fixed? And then just for, for people interested, how difficult is the process of getting a green card and going through all that? Does it take a lawyer and is it, is it this huge, horrible thing or is it something that, that's attainable on your own? Um, I would say it's attainable on your own if you are doing the green card lottery that's that can be attainable on your own because you don't have too many legal things that you have to work through but if you uh, to do a green card and you have a story to tell no matter how good you are about telling your story or how good you think the immigration will listen to your story you are better off with a lawyer. Really? Yes. So back to the lottery real quick. Do they just randomly assign so many green cards every so often? And then if you get one, yay. And if you don't, you got to you gotta keep waiting? Y yes. It's, it's kind of like something that they do every year. Okay. There are numbers that are available. I think about 50,000 that can be allowed to work and come in the U.S. So once you apply, there are certain countries that can apply to come to the U.S. Once you apply and your number is picked, they will give you a waiting period for your number to, to come so that they can you know, put you within the, the frame of the number which is in their goal. Okay. Because they, uh, they can just let all the world come control in. control the flow. <laughs> yeah. Right. So when you said, uh, when, when you're speaking, when you're trying to state your case with immigration, uh, you it's one of these things where you just kind of got to plead your case and hopefully they, 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 they think will. yours has more value and they're going to give you that card? Yes. You're saying lawyers are better at that? Yes. <laughs> they will assist you because you'll be thinking, ah, it's okay, this thing, this is what happened to me or maybe from the country where I come from, you know, this is what, what's, what's happening. You know, I was almost killed mm -hmm. and I can't go back home because the, the, the country where I come from, I am, you know, in the opposition party with the government. Yeah, yeah. It, you, it can be an honest story. You were almost killed and you narrowly escaped. But if you don't tell them all the details, they can say, well, we don't think it's really life-threatening. Hmm. You can just wait a little bit and then go back home. Just hope it all settles down. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So you said that just the lawyers are better at understanding the different things you yes. can use to give you an advantage mm -hmm. to kind of kind of help go your way. Very good. Because they know all the 
they know all the, the, the laws and things that change because with immigration, they are consistently updating or twisting things or changing things. Uh, for instance, I know for sure that they realized that women, after being abused, they were scared to come forward to, to talk about it. So they could be divorced, but not be able to come out and say, hey, this, this is what happened to me. So there might be somebody that is probably listening right now. Maybe you divorced and you think this is over. I was supposed to apply while I was in the marriage. But now they've given women the room to say even after you are divorced, they have given you a two-year window hmm. to fix things for yourself so you can get back in track, so you can fend things for yourself. Because without a status in the U.S., you cannot be able to work. You cannot get work authorization. Right. So if you don't have work author authorization, you there's no way you can get money to support yourself. And I think when people discuss their issues with immigration, legal immigration, this is really the part they're talking about. They're not talking about the hundreds of thousands of people who are doing yeah. it right, who are here right. It's the people who, whatever their reason, whether it's good, bad, out of their control or not, they're here and they're having to work outside the rules or outside of the system. And mm -hmm. what you know, whether that is okay or whether it's not, whether it has positive effects or not, I think we we focus on this one little part and we call it immigration, but there's so much yeah. else that goes with it. Yes. Awesome. And there are real lives yes. that are involved. Yes. And I, I personally would rather have people get work authorization so that they can work, at least support themselves, and if they can go back home, then the U.S. doesn't have to pay for them. They can use their money to go back. There you go. Last, we got just a couple minutes left. Um, what has been your experience adjusting or assimilating into the U.S. culture? It has been, it has been a, a nice time to really adjust, uh, not only into the culture, but being able to network with others, being able to make friends, but one of the things that I've noticed or one of the things that I encourage even some of my friends to do is when you come to the U.S., you come with uh, certain expectations um, and you also come with uh, kind of like a way that you, you think things are going to run like they run at home, whatever country you come mm -hmm. from. But then in the U.S., uh, Things have rules, and then people are cautious. So, like, for instance, in the country where I come from, if I just meet someone and I say, hey, um, my name is Madeline Dambakoa, and my father is from Zaka, and if they say, oh, I'm from Zaka too, and my totem is uh, Moyo, and they say, I am a Moyo too, you are friends, you can go to their house, you can share intimate things together, but that doesn't happen in the <laughs> U.S. <laughs> because you, you, you make friends and you don't even have your friend's cell phone number because their <laughs> cell phone number has their address and it's personal. Mm -hmm. So that was... That was my huge problem because I'm kind of like a friendly person. I'm losing the village, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. But now I was able to adjust, know what works for the other person. If it's a handshake, I give them a handshake. If it's a hug, I give them a hug. Uh, being able also to accommodate others and to change even in places where it's, it's not within my comfort zone. Awesome. Madeline, we are completely out of time. But I want to thank you so much for sharing and for coming thank on. You. And uh, if there's more to share, we need to have you back. Thank you so and much. Matt. We'll be right back after this break. Don't go anywhere. We got one more guest for you.
Hello, if you're just joining us, we're in the home stretch of our August edition of Anderson Speaks, and I'm still your host, Kyle Densler. We're here with our final guest for this segment, and that is a repeat offender, so to speak. He's been here a couple <laughs> months ago. This is Alex Stringfellow. Alex, welcome nice to back to you. the show, sir. I think we've met before. Have we? Yes, yes, we did. Yes, yes so. I can see how important that was for you. <laughs> now, Alex was on just a couple uh, months ago, I believe where I had the privilege of sitting with you and Dr. Dallas Jackson, and we discussed uh, both of you had gone to China, mm -hmm. and you are back to talk more about I that. I am. Because there is more to talk about. Oh, there's plenty to talk about. And we got to get that started. student perspective, because uh, we don't want to be curmudgeon-like and not hearing from the young people and learning and changing. I agree. I agree. Wow. Wow. The excitement about education in the studio is... Palpable. Yes, it is. Absolutely, it's palpable. So refresh the folks at home, refresh their memories on what your first visit was about. Um, uh, just the, um, the group that you went with, who you went through, the mm -hmm. organization, why you went, and then we're going to get into this one specific. Well, uh, sometime last year, about in October time, I was offered the opportunity to apply to go to China as part of a scholarship group, and I went with, I ended up winning. I uh, from the entire Forest Hill school, school District, I was selected, and I went with Dr. Dallas Jackson to China and uh, spent the time with 15, or 14 other scholarship winners. And we, it was through EF tours, and we spent uh, 10 days in China. We went to Shanghai, Beijing, the Great Wall, and also uh, went to a youth summit uh, where we discussed some of the issues that are facing our world today. So the summit was kind of the, the main focus of going. It you was, got yes. to see stuff. You got to mm -hmm. learn. Because I think I shared I went on an EF tour when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of talking and notes and sharing and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But it felt very kind of um, touristy. Like yes. you got to visit the sites. But you had a job. You had a goal. A yeah, it, it was centered deal. on the summit. And so awesome. we tried to tie everything that we saw into the summit. And we did that the second day while we were there. So we really could, everything afterwards could be connected to the summit in some way. So how long were you there total? Ten days. Ten days. So let's start at touchdown. I mean, okay. I, no, let's start lift off because that's quite a ways over there. How long did it take it you to get there? It took about 15, 16 hours to get there to wow. China. It took about, uh, well, I flew from Cincinnati to L.A. Uh, it took about not too many hours. And then uh, from L.A., we spent the night in L.A., uh, did a little bit of sightseeing there, and then flew over to China in one of the new uh, Boeing 777s. Really? I must say they are incredible. Machines. Heavenly sounds oh, like. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how many points I get for that one. Um, so the the flight from L.A. to you touch down in straight, right, mm -hmm. straight to China? Yeah, uh, Shanghai, was yes. Was that the 15? or That was the 15, yes. Wow. It was. The, I, the plane definitely made the flight a lot better, and I enjoyed it. Good. How many movies did you watch? Oh, Let's not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Educational tour. Like, oh, I saw 10 new movies. Uh, so you, you touch down, and just from the get-go, what are, because what um, we discussed there's a lot of stuff that's in English. It, it's pretty easy mm -hmm. to get around in, in certain parts. It is. Uh, but what was your, uh, just your immediate reaction to what you saw? Uh, well, when we first, the, probably the evening while we were there, we touched down about 9 o'clock Shanghai time. Uh, everything, the airport was incredibly grand. I mean, it would put... It, it was extremely modern looking and very big and spacious. It would put a lot of airports here to shame. But I did notice there weren't that many people there. I mean, for 9 o'clock at night at a, the airport, international airport in a big city, there didn't seem to be too many people where we were. Hmm. Uh, but as you were saying, uh, most of the street signs and other signs inside the airport were in English. Uh, it was very easy to get around. Uh, and the people that we met weren't exactly friendly, but we could work with them, uh, the Chinese people, and a lot of them did speak fairly good English. They weren't hostile, like, oh, here comes these American oh, no, they weren't brats hostile, no. and whatever they would say. Did they do, did they do this? Did they, they did not do the fist, no. Okay. I, I don't want to be incorrect about that. I want to be factual. Um, so you touch down. Uh, your first day is sightseeing, educational? What's yeah, like? we spent the first day sightseeing in Shanghai, so we got to see. Uh, well, the first thing we saw was the, the temple, one of the temples in Shanghai. There's quite a few of them, but this was one of the grandest ones. Uh, it was incredible to see the temples. I mean, all the different uh, religious figures. Uh, just to see it was absolutely marvelous, especially thinking that these things were created, these temples were created uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and then the city grew around these temples. Yet, But the temples still exist. They weren't crowded out by the 
people that now live there. That's one of the coolest things for me, just being even places in America and getting to go to Europe, is being places that literally thousands of years ago, mm -hmm. there were people like writing about being there. You right. Like, yeah. uh, I'm standing right yes. here. That's just very cool to me. And then you get outside, and then it's a completely different world. And I took us some uh, pr pretty cool pictures where you can see the old world and the new world, and I thought it was very interesting. Just how well they've been able to preserve their history alongside their how they're going now. What's the architecture like, uh, old world and new? Have, have, is old world kind of the, the you know, I'm, this is going to sound really ignorant, and I apologize, mm -hmm. folks, but okay, because my ki I have kids, mm -hmm. you know, the way they draw things in like Kung Fu Panda. Is that, I mean, because are, are, I mean, I know what time yeah. looks like, but for the folks at home, is is the old world and new world, Is do you still see a lot of that? Do they incorporate that in the new world? Or is it kind of like, hey, if I looked real quick, I would think I was in America? Uh, well, the old world, you're definitely not wrong about that. It doesn't look a lot like how the Kung Fu Panda style uh, with the pagoda type There were no talking roof. pandas, though. There were no talking pandas. At least we didn't get to see any on our part. Okay. Uh, and the New World Architect doesn't seem to incorporate too many of the Chinese characteristics. They've gone above and beyond to a really clean, elegant level in their architecture now. Wow. Very cool. We, I'm thinking of, um, what's, what's the, the Middle Eastern? Dubai. Mm -hmm. Just how they're, they're not only modern, but they're actually setting the bar in some yes, places. Yes, yes. I always, I, I appreciate other people challenging us. We got to tour uh, this building that was shaped like a bottle opener, actually. It was really? rectangular, and it tapered up at the top, and in uh, like 90% of the way up, there was a rectangle cut out of it. <laughs> and uh, so the Google offices that we got to see were about 70% of the way up, uh, and it was incredibly cool architecture, uh, very clean, very aesthetically pleasing, and it was revolutionary to see just what we saw in the building and then what was outside because not everything, as I was saying, is so modern. Like uh, most of the buildings there are seem like they're buildings from the 60s or 70s, uh, concrete buildings. And so there's a variety of architectures that you get to see in just a couple of blocks. And I think in America, typically anywhere you go, there's kind of a consistency when it comes to mm -hmm. how modern things are. So you're saying you got to go in this bottle opener building where Google has their Chinese headquarters, yes. but then not far, you're you're in like what, like, is it like time warp? Uh, yeah, a couple of blocks away, I mean, you have buildings that were built 50 years ago, and then you go a little bit farther, and you have the temples that I was talking about that were wow. built hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Wow. What sort of, uh, do they, are they just kind of there for you to peruse, or do they have any sort of demonstrations, any sort of festivals that you got to enjoy? The temples? Uh, we didn't get to enjoy any festivals, but there are, uh, they are working temples. People do go there and pray, and we have to be very respectful of them. And one interesting thing that I learned is, uh, in China, in the temples and in the royal palaces, they have their thresholds, their doors are raised. They're usually made of metal and they're raised. And depending on how high they are, uh, signifies how important they are. The emperor's uh, thresholds were about this high off the ground. Anybody that can see about this really? high off the ground. Yes, and it was almost like just like a mini, like a half yes. wall. Yes, and the, you're not supposed to step on these. They're essentially the outside world and the inside world. Uh, and in the temples, we had them, and we had to be careful not to step over them. It's considered very rude. Uh, but inside the temples, it was very, very interesting to see how their religion works. I'm trying to imagine the emperor having to climb over this wall all the time. Yes. It seems like he wouldn't want the opposite. Like, everyone else has high walls, <laughs> and I get nice low even. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so your first day, something like you guys got into a mm -hmm. lot. Um, oh, that's not even the start of it. I mean, just, uh, we don't have much time, but uh, we got to take a look at the silk factory. Oh, very and cool. Which was really interesting. Uh, they take the silkworms, they showed us how they boil them down, and how they extract the silk and the finished product, which is truly amazing. Wow. And just to get to feel the real silk is very, very cool. I had a couple silk shirts in the 90s. They were soft. <laughs> so I know what that's well, all about. They were silky smooth, yep. Yes. <laughs> Not good to wear it in the summer. But that's for a person who sweats a lot like me. Um, Continue. I, I I love this. Just keep telling me about stuff that you that you learned, what you got to see, and then and then launch us into the second day and, and, and focus because we're about halfway through. Mm -hmm. So, whenever you want to get onto the summit, but I love hearing about some okay. stuff to get to uh, see. Well, I'll just say a little, a couple more things about my visit. Not necessarily on the first day. Uh, well, we got to see in Shanghai. We also visited the uh, Civil Engineering Museum, and it just shows the progression of Shanghai through the years, and it was interactive and it took us through the earliest beginnings as a fishing village all the way to uh, the metropolitan area that it is now. Uh, and then later on we got to see Beijing. And Beijing's a little bit more of the old style. There didn't seem to be as many of the 
massive imposing sky rises. And what I mean by sky rise is in Cincinnati we have 10, 15 maybe in the downtown area. It stretched on for miles. We had a hotel that could be considered on the outskirts of Shanghai and in all the directions we looked around there were buildings that would come close to dwarfing the ones we have downtown. So it was more like Manhattan, more like downtown yes, New York except is what we're thinking. It was a spread over a huge scale. I mean there were tall buildings wow. everywhere and it, people were living them. It was fantastic to see. Just the sheer amount of people they could fit into the, that city. It's crazy. Yes. It's like it's very dense. Yeah, it is very dense, yes. <laughs> and Beijing had more of the older architecture, though. Most of the buildings were probably constructed 50 years ago or earlier. And uh, there was also a different vibe in Beijing. It was more of a traditional, family-oriented. It seemed a lot more back to the basics of Chinese, whereas Shanghai, even the people that had nothing to do with what was going on commercially, Still seem to be fast. It still seemed to be faster paced compared to Beijing. It's more tuned towards um, a tourist or I don't want to say business. Western. Yeah, but, yeah, but kind yeah, of a business. Westerners speed. and businesses. Yeah, yeah. it was. I, I, more people seem to speak English as well in Shanghai, uh, but Beijing had most of the cultural. It was the cultural capital essentially of China. So we got to see all the Forbidden City, Tiananmen Square, all those things. One interesting thing about the Forbidden City is the Chinese consider the number nine to be lucky. Take a guess at how many rooms are in the Forbidden City. Is it like 999 or something? 9,999. Oh my gosh. Yes. I was only off by a one decimal spot. <laughs> yeah, it was. Degree. <laughs> you would just keep walking and walking and walking, and it would get bigger and bigger. It was fancy. This, the sheer scale, this was, these were built centuries ago to see what they were able to build. And this isn't even talking about the Great Wall, where it was. In, the Great Wall is definitely one of the wonders of the world. It's wide, it's tall, and to realize that people had built this without power tools was absolutely incredible. And then the views, to see all around, it was immaculate. Crazy, Insane. crazy. What was your favorite thing outside of the summit mm -hmm. and kind of the uh, business reasons uh, you were there? What was, what was your favorite thing? I think my favorite thing may have been just being there. Not necessarily one of the sites, but it was a whole different culture that I got to experience. And just walking the streets when we had our free time, where not necessarily in the western section with all the shopping malls and skyscrapers, just getting to walk amongst the Chinese people I thought was... Where you incredible. felt like you weren't still in America. Uh, yes. It, cool. it was just mind-boggling. And it, I learned so much just by being there. So much that I wouldn't have been able to learn just by reading about China. Very cool. Briefly, we kind of touched on this in the last interview, but with, with, with China being a, a communist uh, government mm -hmm. and having so much control over things, did you get a sense of any sort of authoritarian presence where you went, or did it feel kind of like we feel here, like you kind of just go, or did, did you feel kind of the big brother presence, or mm -hmm. did you feel like I, I need to mind my P's and Q's? Did you see a lot of presence? No. Uh, I mean, the most we ever saw were security guards or policemen out there, maybe one or two military officers. But there, I think the most security was around Tiananmen Square. There were more policemen, more military people. Uh, but no, it didn't seem like anybody was watching us. We were free essentially to do and explore whatever we wanted to. And I thought that was very interesting, especially going there thinking, oh, China's a communist country, it's very regimented, such and such. It seemed very open, and especially, it seemed friendly to Westerners, I have to say. Hmm. And the people that also lived there didn't seem too constricted by the so-called communist government. I do know that the government keeps Google pretty busy, though, with stuff. Mm -hmm. stuff they're supposed they, to be they, let's just say they couldn't tell us too much about how their search engine and what they did in China. I bet. I bet. Uh, okay, so... so main focus was the summit. Mm -hmm. Remind us again what the purpose of the summit was and then just, you know, share some more of those stories. The summit was essentially, it's, uh, it was about social responsibility in the new global economy. And so that's talking about especially socially responsible businesses where not only can you make a profit, but you can do something to help the world. And it was a, it's a new idea. It's, it's becoming more and more popular now, something that I didn't really know about. And I think that was one of the main things I learned, uh, how to tie together social responsibility and capitalism. I thought that was incredibly interesting. Uh, and I also got to learn, I was in the public health group of it, because we were divided into four different groups of our choosing. And I got to learn a lot about public health, and especially just how to, I learned a lot about how to reach out to other people, and especially working with the Chinese people that were in the summit. There were people from Shanghai and Beijing that spoke very good English, I mean, like proper English, and 
I think just meeting so many rich, diverse people that brought so many ideas to the table was fascinating. And we had incredible keynote speakers. We had Alex Bloomberg and Adam Davidson of Planet Money. They hmm. uh, talked about how a t-shirt was made, essentially the process through which it goes through almost everywhere in the world to become a t-shirt that's marketed to us. And we had uh, John Huntsman, who was the former governor to China, yeah. and gover or ambassador to China, governor mm -hmm. of Utah, who came to speak to us about how the U.S. needs to stay competitive and how there really needs to be a partnership between the U.S. and China, and it's going to become one of the biggest partnerships the world has ever seen. I think we were discussing we already kind of do have a partnership. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think what he meant was we as people need to take initiative, and yeah. everybody needs to stay competitive in the global economy. So whether it's learning a new language or becoming better with computers, something that each of us can do in Anderson Township to become more competitive and more valuable to the global economy. Awesome, awesome. Uh, give us some specifics. What was the, uh, the project, that you, or if you had more than one, what was the favorite project that your group had to tackle? And, and how did you go about it? What was the uh, Well, it was very result? nice. They gave us, they didn't give us much, many restrictions. So essentially, we got to come up with a project that was based on public health, based on public health, and was socially responsible, but it was a business. And just the brief overview, it was called Glass for the Masses. And essentially, we realized there was a problem that many people in highland areas, poor highland areas, uh, were getting eye diseases, whether cataracts or other things. Mm. Uh, and sunglasses, they needed sunglasses in order to be able to function longer and be able to have more productive lives. So essentially, our business was similar to the Tom's model, where we mm. uh, sell to high-end Western customers, but then money comes back, sunglasses come back, that we can then give to those poor upland farmers and other workers, uh, and so that they can then bring themselves out of poverty and be more productive and have better lives. And briefly, the, the Tom's model is the Tom's shoe model, Tom's shoe model where yes. whenever time someone here purchases a pair of shoes, they send a pair of shoes to someone somewhere who needs it, which yes. is pretty cool. So that, and that's, that was an example you gave last time mm -hmm. of kind of the socially responsible Yeah, that is thing. one of the main uh, socially responsible models. So you guys came up with the, the glasses for the masses. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well. You know what stinks? What? We're out of time. Oh, really? But you know what's cool? We're going to come back for a tiebreaker. Yes, we are. Because you, Alex Stringfellow, <laughs> need to come back and give us some stories because you, um, if I understand correct, are an Eagle Scout. I am. That is yeah. something else that I know I'm personally interested in. I don't want to speak for everybody, <laughs> but uh, I'd love to have you come back. I think the plans are in the works. We're going over signing yeah, bonus and contractual obligations. and I have to talk to my sponsorships. agent Sponsorships. Well, she's, well I'll, I'll, I'll pull her aside afterwards. But um, <laughs> no, have you come back. And just share, share your experience with Boy Scouts mm -hmm. and because um, people make a big deal about this Eagle Scout thing, you know? They do. It's kind of, kind of a big deal. It is. And I would love to share with everybody awesome. how my project was and how I got there. Awesome. Thank Good you very seeing much. You again, buddy. All right. We are all done for the month of August here on Anderson Speaks at Anderson Community Television. Check us out on YouTube. You can see all of our backlog, just a plethora of fantastic editions. And we're looking forward to seeing you guys next month as well. Have a good one. You're watching Anderson Community Television. This is your August edition of Anderson Speaks. Welcome, I'm your host, Kyle Densler, and I'd like to introduce to you all out there in Anderson land, our first guest with us is Wendy Silvius. She is a resident of Mount Washington, and she also teaches at Indian Hill, and she's got some really cool stories to share with us. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, uh, you're here to discuss uh, a little trip. 
A little That's trip? trip? <laughs> yeah, it's, it was a pretty big trip, actually. I was very fortunate to be um, able to travel to Ghana last March to West Africa to participate in teacher exchange. And it was part of a program called Teachers for Global Classrooms. Hmm. And how, how were you made aware of this trip? Is this something that you've been a part of, or is this all kind of new to you? Well, um, I'm always interested in international travel, and I've been, I teach geography at Indian Hill, so I've been very that fortunate to um, be able to go out there and see some of the places that I teach about. And I had not been to Africa at all and uh, became aware of this program through the U.S. State Department. So they made teachers aware of it just you know, through email, and, and it was something that you could apply for and always interested in a new adventure and wanting to be able to share firsthand stories with my students, I decided to apply for it and uh, fortunately was accepted uh, to participate last year. So it was a little more than just a trip. It had a large um, professional development component to it where awesome. um, we had an online class that we took and we got to network with other teachers around the country as we learned more about global education and how to bring the rest of the world into our classrooms. Um, and of course, there's no better way to do that than having a first-hand experience and having stories to tell and and those stories and those first-hand connections with people are much more interesting to students than information in a book or you know some type of statistics so it was a Definitely. great great way to bring the world into my classroom awesome do you have any idea of the total number of people that got to participate in this trip the total number of teachers every year I think is around 75 um, from around the country because there are actually six different countries that the State Department sends teachers to. And the oh, State wow. Department does a lot of exchanges. Um, they have their Fulbright exchanges and um, you know lots of different programs, but this is just one of their programs that they do. Awesome. So they just load you up, fly you over, and stick you on a bus, and then you guys have to... <laughs> like, when, when you get Not a bunch quite. of teachers with no, no students around, uh, no, we you were we had a, a member of... Uh, they, they Actually, they administer this program through a, a nonprofit called IREX, the International Research and Exchanges Board. And so we had a person who um, worked for IREX who had been to Ghana before who was with us and everything was planned um, very thoroughly. And uh, Ghana is an easy country to get around in. Everyone speaks English, very, very friendly, but we did have that additional help of having a guide and, and all, all the things taken care of for us. So it was very easy for us. Why Ghana? Why, I mean, what was significant about that specific country? Yeah, well, the countries were selected by the State Department, and I think Ghana is a country that a lot of um, Westerners travel to because everyone speaks English. Ghana was a British colony. Um, it's also very stable in terms of its you know, political environment. It's uh, very welcoming to guests overall. And uh, Ghana is, um, in, in terms of its development, is um, a little maybe a little more developed than some other countries in mm -hmm. West Africa. So the infrastructure to travel and um, have access to some of the things that we're maybe used to back home are there. So it's just a great country to visit for a person who's having their first time um, to someplace they're not familiar with or a part of the world that they're not familiar with. And where's the farthest you've traveled before this? Before this, um, Germany. Really? Germany, yes, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. so a little bit of different kind of culture, temperature. Yeah. Climate, yeah, everything. yes, very, very warm being near the equator. That was, um, you know, one of the, the hard things actually for me about the trip, although I'm from Florida, so I should be used to it, but I think I've gotten <laughs> um, spoiled here not being cold, not being hot so often, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, about just some of the uh, logistical parts, in case people are curious, mm -hmm. um, you had several months of probably planning. You got to get mm -hmm. passports together, et cetera. Uh, how long is the flight over? Uh, how yeah, many? the flight over is actually shorter than the flight to Germany. It was about 11 hours okay. over, and it was a direct flight from uh, New York City to Accra, which is the capital of Ghana. Very cool. And how long were you there again? I was there for two weeks, and I was, I was uh, very fortunate because most of the other teachers in our group, there were 10 teachers in our group going to Ghana, and most of the other teachers stayed near the coast and near the capital city. But my travel partner, who was another teacher from Philadelphia, and I were selected to go to this village in the rainforest. And our wow. village was called Sefwi Bikwai. And it was about an eight hour trip, not because it was so far, but just the roads mm -hmm. weren't um, great all the way. But it was an eight hour trip into the heart of Ghana and uh, being able to experience more of rural life and see how people are living who are um, mostly in cocoa farming 
And mm. so some of the kids at the school I visited walked, uh, I think the longest walk we had was seven miles. Somebody was walking seven miles each way to school. Mm. So it was very interesting to see how the school functioned um, because it was more of a boarding school, really. Um, the students, most of the students lived there, and then some of the students walked from around the area. So it kind of served the region, since not everyone in high school gets, uh, not, not everyone in Ghana gets to go to high school. Mm -hmm. um, the kids who do sometimes have a commute like that or have to live there. Okay. What was your main focus or, or kind of main thrust for being there? Was mm -hmm. it to study how they educate, or was mm -hmm. it to learn about the culture? Was it all of that? Yeah, it was really all of that. And with a cultural exchange, the great thing is it's a sharing process. So I have things to learn from you. You have things to learn from me. So we wanted to see how the school worked, um, what types of technology they had, how it operated, what it was like culturally with the students. And so all of that was very, very interesting. Um, there were so many differences, but yet you find out wherever you go that kids are basically the same, you know. Um, but one thing is all students in Ghana wear uniforms. Mm. Um, so what do you think was, about that? You know, it was interesting, too, that it wasn't even just the uniforms. They all have the same haircut. They, all, they shave everybody's head, and that's how they know you're a student. Wow. Um, every student has their head shaved, girls and boys. And so um, it was definitely a more formal relationship with their teachers that they had. They had to address them as madame and... Um, sir and they were very very formal so that was one thing that was interesting as we were trying to do some question and answer with them we would try to get them to speak with us informally the way we would with our students when we were having an exchange and they finally did kind of come around and were able to do that but that was we found they were shy at first and mm. they were used to doing more of a recitation type interaction with their teachers where there's some specific answer they're supposed to give rather than maybe asking questions. Mm. Um, so it was interesting to see those differences and um, just to be able to be there and experience the people and experience the culture. You might have already answered part of this, but mm -hmm. my next thing I was curious about is whether it's through education or just culturally, uh, what was the biggest difference you saw there versus mm -hmm. what we're accustomed to here? And then what would be a strong similarity or maybe one that would surprise people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I guess the biggest difference, um, since I was focused on kids and focused on education, um, more, more people in Ghana are um, still working as farmers. Um, it's still over 50% pe of pe the people in agriculture, whereas it's less than 1% in the mm -hmm. United States. So um, because of that, there still are a lot of kids who are being expected to provide additional labor at home, just as it was in the United States 